to my channel. Hi everybody, how are you doing? Uh, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me again. And we will be continuing now with the discussion, uh, the third part of our story um, in Jean Harlow's life, of Jean Harlow's life. And um, so let me gather my notes and get started. So um, last time we, um, where we left off was that um, in 1931, Yudes loaned out Jean Harlow to MGM Studios and then um, sent her on a very brief stunt uh, publicity tour, let's put it that way. And so that's where we left off last time. And so, um, Jean did enjoy some success with Hell's Angels um, that was shot in 1930. However, um, her career setbacks were marked by her lack of professional training and also some very dangerous um, personal ties. And so um, Jean seemed to draw both good and dangerous attention to herself. So um, when the mobster Benjamin or Bugsy Siegel came to Hollywood to um, build up his casinos, Jean became the godmother of his daughter, Millicent. Um, at the time, the family did live in Beverly Hills. And so this is one example of something that would have drawn a distaste to Mayer, who was the MGM ex executor, uh, executive, I should say. And so um, it, it may have hurt Jean's image. And so um, Jean briefly also dated Abner Zwillman, who started out buying her jewels, a red Cadillac, and then proceeded to bribe uh, the studio head of MGM, Harry Kahn, to obtain uh, a two-year um, contract deal. Um, no, actually, that's a two-picture contract deal for uh, Jean Harlow. Um, and... Uh, at Columbia, at Columbia Studios. And so that relationship did end when he began to refer to Jean in vulgar terms. So we don't know what happened. Um, I, I, I don't, I haven't come across any stories, but um, I, I am sure that there was a long and complex and drawn out reason for that falling out. So that's what I'm saying. She wasn't always a very good judge of character. She was very young. How could she possibly be a good judge of character? You know what I'm saying? Now, um, despite um, her apparent professional shortcomings, Jean's fashion um, awareness, her fashion savvy, and her statements created a huge craze for women, American women, and um, she became Hollywood's most aspiring model of beauty, and she indeed was, um, uh, and I am sure that the future actress or starlet, uh, Marilyn Monroe, modeled herself on that image. Um, which was beautiful. So this um, very um, unique and individual sense of style also very much included her hair, uh, the shape, the color, and everything about it. And it all began when Columbia first cast Jean in Frank Capra's film with Loretta Young, um, for um, the lead character, but it was renamed Platinum Blonde to um, capitalize on Hughes, uh, you, Howard Hughes' um, publicity of Jean's platinum hair. And so um, initially the role was for Loretta Young, and then um, 
Jean took it. So um, though Jean denied that her hair was bleached, I don't think anybody would dare to try to deny it. Um, it, you know, um, it was bleached and its platinum color um, was achieved with two um, or one, I'm not sure which is right, uh, weekly applications of ammonia, Clorox bleach, and um, soap, Lux soap. <laughs> Lux soap flakes, and I am truly surprised that it did not break off right at the roots. Maybe it did, I don't know. And so, um, uh, I don't know whose idea that was. I really don't. Uh, maybe her mom's, maybe hers. So many American females began to also dye their hair, and Hughes, Howard Hughes, um, organized a publicity stunt um, entitled Platinum Blonde uh, to salons and clubs uh, offering $10,000 to any beautician who could match hollow. Nobody probably would or could since it was such a, an unhealthy um, uh, mixture for anybody's hair. And so um, nobody did replicate that. And the prize money went unclaimed. But the, um, the plan did work. And Platinum Blonde, the, the, that was a nickname, Platinum Blonde, for Jean Harlow. And it stuck. And I'm not surprised that it did. So um, while at Columbia, uh, Jean's... Jean went on to do a second film, and uh, that was entitled Three Wise Girls, and it came out in 1932. And that um, starred Mae Clark and Walter Byron. Paul Byrne um, then arranged with Howard Hughes to borrow her for MGM's um, movie, Beast of the City, that came out in 1932, which starred Walter Huston. And so after filming that, Byrne then booked a 10-week personal appearance tour on the East Coast. And to the surprise of many, especially Jean, um, she packed every theater. She packed every theater, and, um, you know, it, it often appearing in a single um, event for several nights in a row. And so they were held over, guys. Um, despite critical um, criticism of her poor roles, um, Harlow's, Jean Harlow's popularity and following um, was very large, they were very large and kept growing. And so by February 1932, the tour had been extended by another six weeks. And so considering her traditional reluctance, just like Marilyn Monroe, to um, uh, appear publicly, this 16-week stint would have um, absolutely been very grueling for her. Uh, mentally, you know, uh, emotionally, and so um, I'm I'm surprised that she got through it. Now, um, according to the actress Faye Ray, who played Anne Darrow in uh, King Kong, nineteen thirty three, Jean was uh, the original choice for that movie. Um, as a blonde uh, actress or heroine of the film, but under exclusive, she was then under an exclusive contract with MGM. So the part naturally had to go to someone else and it went to Faye Ray. And so um, hair color did play a big part in her, um, the direction of her movie career. So ninth, the years from, let's focus on the years from um, the, the last five years of her life, 1932 to 1937. So um, Jean, uh, at 21, 
Jean achieved a very successful career as an actress at MGM. And Paul Byrne, uh, an executive there, um, was romantically involved with Jean and spoke to uh, Louis B. Mayer about buying her contract from Hughes, Howard Hughes. Um, so... Uh, and they wanted to sign her on. Maybe Louis B. Mayer wasn't so sure or keen on it, but uh, Paul Byrne was. And so um, Mayer, Louis B. Mayer did decline. And the logic behind that refusal was that um, MGM's leading ladies were elegant and they weren't real. <laughs> I, ha I couldn't help just putting that in. Um, and Jean's screen persona was not elegant. Not to Mayer. And so Byrne began urging Irvin um, Thadberg or Thamberg, my typos, uh, uh, he was the production head of MGM, and he urged him to hire Jean, noting her popularity and her beautiful and, and captivating image. And so, I, guys, she absolutely sparkled. There, there's no doubt about it. She had something that most actress, actors and actresses, they, they couldn't have been able to achieve it no matter what they did. Um, but she had that sparkle and that quirk, and um, it, it really shone on film. And I don't think Louis B. Mayer could have done anything about it. You know what I'm saying? Um, it sold. It sold. And after initial uh, his initial reluctance, Thalberg, Thalberg, um, relented, and on March the 3rd, 1932, which was Jean's 21st birthday, um, MGM purchased her contract um, from Hughes and Howard Hughes, and um, it was uh, sold for $30,000, and Jean officially then joined MGM Studios uh, in April, um, a month later, 1932. Wow. So um, at MGM, uh, Jane finally was giving superior movie roles and star treatment. So um, it, that these roles highlighted her looks and um, also they highlighted something that she was naturally born with, uh, a comedic talent. So though her screen persona changed dramatically throughout her career, uh, the one constant was that sense of humor. And so I do see such a huge connect connection here with um, the future starlet, Marilyn Monroe, who first uh, appeared in Tinseltown, um, as Norma Jean Baker in the 40s. And so, um, guys, they were very similar in, in persona, in looks, the way that they were groomed for movies. Um, they both had that comical quirk about them. Um, I, I love both of these actresses to death, um, simply for their naturalistic uh, presence on film. You know what I'm saying? However, um, Jean still had that, um, I, I don't know, that, that almost undesirable, um, streetwise, shifty image to many people. And I, I know that Marilyn Monroe went through that too. But in 1932, um, Jean did star in a, in a type of comedy that humanized her. It brought her right down to earth with everybody else. And it made her quite, quite likable and lovable. Um, and so I, it must have been so hard to break down those barriers in those days. Um, that comedy was called Red-Headed Woman. And 
she received $1,250 per week throughout the filming. And so it was the first film where she resembled an actress uh, who happened to be an amoral character and not moralized. She was not punished um, for her behavior in any way. Harlow did not appear as a platinum blonde. And that was a big part of it. And I know that I think it was called The Babysitter. Marilyn Monroe did the same thing there. Uh, Not her, but the studios. They knew how to manipulate the audiences and capture their hearts. So, um, you know, it's amazing how some things never change, right? movie that I'm speaking about, um, Jean wore a red wig to cover her platinum hair. And so it dramatically um, changed uh, the audience audience's perception of her um, and her onstage persona. Um, actually, the role was written just for her. And so... Um, uh, you know, I. it was a very clever um, tactic, but it worked. And so, um, also, um, this movie was perhaps the role that changed Jean and her own perception of her um, self-image. And so, um, while filming The Red-Headed Woman, um, the actress Anita Page passed Jean on the lot one day without really acknowledging her. It was out of character for Anita. And so um, uh, what happened was that Jean was so offended um, that she later told Anita that the snub caused her to run to her wardrobe room and, and cry until she finally got a good look at herself in a mirror and didn't know who she was. And so that, that was funny, guys. And so um, Jean herself um, took off the wig and began bursting out laughing. She went from tears to, to laughter in seconds. And um, Anita, she knew that Anita had simply not recognized her. So, um, yeah, that, that was... That was really something else. And so um, romantic ties on the set um, bolstered her career, but uh, real life continued to foil Jean's steady climb to stardom. So although she was having some success with her fame and her career, um, life was still too real. You know what I'm saying? It was really dishing out... um, crap for her. And so um, what happened was Jean next starred after that in a movie called Red Dust, um, her second film with Clark Gable. So Jean and Gable worked so well together. And um, yeah, I would have too um, if it was Gable. And so uh, they co-starred, they went on to co-star in six more films together. And so um, she Um, was also paired with other actors. These actors were Spencer Tracy, William Powell, and um, MGM tried to distinguish Jean's uh, public persona from her screen characters by putting out um, publicity and press releases for her Uh, that her real name was not Carpenter, but Carpentier, with the I in in the, um, in there, right? So um, that was silly. 
anyway, um, the um, it, it also there was also a story that claimed Edgar Allan Poe was actually her ancestor uh, because it was her mother's maiden name that was Poe. Whether or not it's true, I doubt it. Um, but uh, what happened was they published photographs of Jean doing charity work, and um, she, she they tried to give her more of an all-American woman image. Really, why? They're, they were the ones that gave her that other image. Um, I, I don't understand. Uh, this transformation attempt uh, proved to be very difficult, and to me, quite hypocritical and typical of the way that the movie industry operated and most likely at some levels still does in, in some places. Um, why men were masterminding this ridiculous stuff, I'll never know. But um, Jean herself once was overheard muttering, geez, must I always wear such low-cut dresses to be um, seen as important? So that is a very telling statement. And it means to me that she was being shoved into whatever um, image um, these men wanted her to have. So anyway, um, so who can see... Nobody, it, it, it's, it's very clear to me. Um, hold on. So one can actually see why she had such a, a hard time disposing of that negative um, skin, that negative outer layer. And so it was because it was um, a grooming a grooming tactic used by studios for all starlets. And so during the filming of Red Dust with Gable, um, Byrne, who was then uh, her husband of two months, was unfortunately and shockingly um, found dead at home, um, and it created a huge scandal, of obviously. And so initially, Jean was suspected of killing her husband, but his death was ruled a suicide by self-inflicted gunshot wounds. And so the authenticity of the note that was left at the scene was challenged. And so um, nobody knew, knows what, what really happened. Whatever did happen, it was covered up. And I'm not going to go into any of... I, I have no thoughts or opinions on this because simply I don't know. So I'm not going to comment. I didn't know Jean. I, I didn't know what she was like. So how can I, you know, um, I, I can't... I can't argue with anybody's statement because I don't know what the truth was. I don't know what happened. Um, it, it seems to me impossible that a man married two months would do that. And um, he absolutely doted on Jean, as many men did. Um, so I don't understand. I don't understand the meaning of the cryptic letter either. And I'll read it to you. It went like this. Dearest dear. Unfortunately, this is the only way to make good the frightful wrong I have done you. They must have had a fight. Um, and uh, to wipe out my abject, abject humiliation. Um, so it just goes on. I love you, Paul. His first name was Paul. And understanding, um, it says, you understand that last night was only a comedy. What the heck? If that is encrypted, I don't know what is. So um, what happened was, Louis B. Mayer, fe um, he really feared negative publicity. It's all about him, right? And not about Jean at all. She doesn't enter the picture here. And so... Um, she was only 21. 
what happened was he uh, immediately raced to replace Gene, and he would have done the whole, he would have redone the whole movie, and he offered the role to Talula Bankhead. Now, Talula responded ma magnificently and was truly appalled by this ridiculous offer and flatly refused. And she wrote later on in her um, autobiography that to damn the radiant gene for a misfortune um, of another would be one of the shabbiest acts of all time. I told Mr. Mayor as much. Good for her. Good for her. Um, somebody had to put these men in their places. And who but somebody like Tallulah Bankhead could have done that better. <laughs> um, so anyway, and Jane, of course, um, she, uh, you know, she didn't do anything. She kept silent. She survived. What could she do? She was just starting her career, right? Um, I, I Honestly, this is so bizarre. Um, and it became, what happened was, uh, Gene just simply became as popular as ever, even though the media and the public knew that Paul Byrne had been found dead. And so, um, uh, I... Uh, a 2009 biography of Byrne asserted that he was murdered by a former lover, maybe male, I don't know, and um, a crime. Uh, the crime scene was rearranged by MGM to make it appear that he committed suicide. And so um, maybe it was also a hoax to ditch Jean. I don't know. Um, Paul, if it weren't for Paul Byrne, she wouldn't have been in that movie with Clark Gable, the second movie. So, you know what I'm saying? Paul Byrne made her, and I'm sure that she doted on, I don't think Jean would have been the type to marry anybody, uh, even at 21, had she not been in love. That's the way, that's the kind of character that she, um sort of strikes me as, but I could be wrong. Of course, I didn't know her. But um, so um, I could really believe that it was a hoax to um, ditch Jean. It really was. But to go as far as to commit murder, that was really shabby. I don't know. I don't know the details. So I can't, I can't um, theorize about it. And so, guys, um, can you see me? After, after Byrne's death, Harlow began a very indiscreet um, uh, affair with a boxer named Max Bear. Um, is that the same Max Bear who starred in the, um, the Beverly Hills Hillbillies or something like that? Anyway, um, he was married, but separated from his wife, Dorothy Dunbar. Um, and um, sh his wife, Dorothy, threatened him with divorce proceedings that would name Jean as a co-respondent for alienation of affection, which was, and still is, a legal term for adultery. And that would have finished her. So she wasn't thinking clearly, guys. She was... Um, Obviously, in a lot of pain. Um, I don't know what happened, but um, after Byrne's death, the uh, studio did not want another scandal and diffused the whole entire situation by arranging a marriage. Oh, wonderful idea. Uh, between Harlow and cine cinema photographer Harold Rawson. Rawson and Jean were friends, and so he did go along with the plan, and they were very quietly divorced eight months later. Unbelievable. Why do men concoct such ridiculous schemes? I don't understand it. 
anyway, guys, as you can see, I have no more light. So I'm going to end the vlog here. I uh, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you've enjoyed listening to the third part of the Jean Harlow story. Stay tuned. There's more. And um, isn't it fascinating? I just love this entire era, don't you? And so um, thank you very much, and I'll see you very soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.